Billy Bones, Davy John. Everyone sing along because you're going to go by the way of Billy one day. It is the great Billy Bones song by Skip Henderson. I'm Michael Savage, broadcasting live from San Francisco. It's actually San Fran Filtho, San Fran Crimo. Today is the Kate Steinle trial. The defense is trying to say that the illegal alien who shot Kate Steinle did it by accident, you hear? And the case should be thrown out. I'll have more to report on that. That's how sick the city is. It's not bad enough that the illegal alien bum is still here. And that he killed an innocent girl in front of a father. But the progressives, so-called, the psycho-progressives, want him relieved of all charges. It was an accident, you see. He was just shooting at pigeons with a stolen gun. Anyway, welcome to the program. Today is launch day for me. My book, God, Faith, and Reason, hits the bookstores tomorrow. And I want to talk about don't throw out the old for the new. Do you remember when you were in high school, you heard about the myth of Icarus? You know, the myth of Icarus, the old Greek myth in which Daedalus, Daedalus uh, was imprisoned in the, on the island of Crete. And so he made two pair of wings, gluing feathers to a wooden frame with wax. And he gave a pair of these made-up uh, wings to his son, and he warned his son not to fly too near to the sun because he said, son, if you get too near to the sun... That wax will melt and your wings will fall off. Well, as the younger prone to do, Icarus ignored his father's warning. And as he flew closer to the sun, soaring and soaring and soaring, the feathers came loose from his artificial wings and Icarus plunged to his death into the sea. Why do I bring up this ancient Greek myth today on the Savage Nation? Well, yesterday I read a story in the New York Post about a famed daredevil, Valery Razov, who died crashing into a mountain in Nepal. He was a free-fall jumper who wanted to complete the seven summits, jumping from the highest mountain on all seven continents. Razov flew too close to the sun. He rejected the wisdom that would have told him such feats while exciting are not very wise. This is the way in today's world. We are seeing a shift in the world where a new generation of people are rejecting the wisdom of the older generations. In the early days of civilization, Taking the wisdom of the previous generation was tantamount to the survival of a race, of a people. There was no question you had to learn what had been learned if you're going to survive and move yourself, your tribe, or your group up to the next level. It was life or death. Well, today's civilization has advanced so quickly that if a website doesn't load fast enough, this is cause for distress and anger. We've lost perspective because we've ignored the wisdom of the old. And that includes what we learn about God. Don't turn the dial because you're only two generations away from God-fearing family members. Maybe you could learn something by listening to your inner self. I touched upon this in God, Faith, and Reason in a chapter entitled Glimpses of Literature. On page 27, I talked about being a teenager and not knowing who I was. Well, I did all the typical things a young teenager would do. But I didn't stray too far from what Daedalus warned, I went back and looked at literature. That is, I wanted to learn from the wisdom that had come before me. I was an avid reader. That is one of the things that inspired this book. In a time where it seems everyone has rejected the old for the new, they refuse to look at the old wisdom, despite seeing the new ways are tearing a nation and a people and a world apart. Sometimes the old wisdom is the only wisdom. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Phone number here is 855-407-282. Don't throw out the old for the new. Sometimes the old wisdom is the only wisdom. My book, God, Faith, and Reason, comes out tomorrow. It'll be in bookstores everywhere. I learned only last night, I can't say it was a conspiracy because it isn't, that I have com competition that is beyond belief from one man against the world. You see, there is a boycott of Michael Savage, a blackout. You will not see me on any television show, so far as I know. Joe Biden has written a book. Joe Biden wrote a book, God bless him, and he capitalized on the death of his son, who died of brain cancer, I believe. And it's a book about him and his son. I understand they're printing one million copies of Joe's book. Joe was at the football game last night where they cheered him on, and he got a chance to promote his life and his book. Joe will be on every morning television show in America for the whole week. Not old Mike Savage, though. See, I am a speaker 
who reaches only the deplorables. I don't know who Joe reaches, but it's not you. And so I'm going to ask you, the deplorables, to do what you've done for me in the past. Maybe you could say you've done it for America in the past, because I haven't really changed my lifestyle. I really haven't changed my lifestyle. Ask people who know me. I live in the same little cottage, and I feed pigeons old bread every day. I have the same 13-year-old dog. I'm not doing badly, don't get me wrong. But maybe you want to do something for someone in your family and buy them a copy of God, Faith, and Reason. Maybe you can help that empty soul realize that they're not alone in the world. Just a thought, huh? Now, before this hour is over, I'm going to play something for you that I tore my soul apart thinking about whether to play it or not. As I told you, there's a documentary being made about me, and I played a short two-minute piece of it in Los Angeles for a few uh, friends. Some of them are theatrical, some are production people, and they were moved to tears. It's a two-minute piece called My Silent Brother. In essence, I dedicated my book to my silent brother, Jerome, who never spoke. Allegedly was blind. I don't know if he was really blind. and Couldn't hear, allegedly couldn't hear. I think he heard because he heard me whistle. That's how I learned how to talk to animals and to invisible audiences by talking to a, a, a human being who I was told was not able to hear or see. I know he could hear and see. God, I wish he had been born in this age because he wouldn't have been cast off into a uh, a, a, a hellhole, a hellhole of a state hospital called Willowbrook on Staten Island. If you ever saw pictures of where that poor boy was sent, well, anyway, I, I contemplated whether to play that tape today because I said to myself, Michael, do you really want to capitalize on your brother to sell a book? Let me tell you where I go with my thinking in case you don't know me by now. I'm a soul searcher, and I thought hard about it. I said, what, are you going to capitalize on your poor brother's suffering and death to sell a book? And then a bell went off for me this morning as I was running around getting ready to go on the radio. I said, you're not capitalizing on Jerome. You're letting him live. You're letting him live by telling his story. This little boy who never lived will live by telling his story. It's a big part of God, faith, and reason. I have a sound of it. Why hold it back? I don't want to hold anything back. I want to give my audience everything in the opening of the show, Jim. Why don't we give them everything in the opening of the show? Let's fire it right now, my silent brother. For now, that's enough for now. That's the rest of the documentary coming up. The point of the book in God, Faith, and Reason is there is no point to the book, God, Faith, and Reason. It is a man's search. It's an odyssey. I never saw God, nor do I pretend to have any special insights. What you will see in this book are snapshots of God, not a complete film. And I presented this book in an omnibus style, and it does not have to be read in precise sequential order. What you will see is one man's glimpses of God, images along the road of life. I do not represent myself as a theologian or a guru. There are no cheap thrills here for the spiritually bankrupt masses. It is my scrapbook of the highest power through dreams, memories and stories, much like the ancient texts. This is Michael Savage. I'll be right back. Look, you got to expect something from me this week, and whether you appreciate it or not, or you're angry at me or not, I, I can't help it. I'm a man alone. I have absolutely no chance of being on television with this book. They'd rather have a mass murderer They'd rather seek out someone from Syria who raped 85 women in a secret chamber and rush to put them on the Today Show than me. Think about how sick the people are in the news business. I want you to just think about how debased they are. Trump called them fake news. I'd call them something else. They're not just fake news. These are demonic. These people are demonic. They'd rather have a mass murderer or rapist on than a man of my quality. I've written many best-selling books, five in a row. I've written 28 books. I'm a national treasure. I don't need them to tell me that. I'm telling you that. The demons will, will not let me near them. The demons will not let me near movies, near television. The demons who control the images that the world sees only project the images that demons like. Harvey Weinstein, anyone? So you go in a bookstore in the next couple of weeks. You're going to shop for various people in your family. You're going to impulse buy. 
you know me, you're probably going to buy a copy or two of God, Faith, and Reason, as you normally do. I'm wondering when this book is in the front of those stores, Barnes & Noble, all those other great stores around the country, Books A Million, they all have them. Sam's Club, I believe. Costco's going to have them. Will the impulse buyer, when they see this man with the uh, salt and pepper beard, with the purple shirt, with the white stripes and the purple tie, with luminous eyes, uh, Vince Romini caught a piece of my soul with this picture, i got to tell you, it's, it's shocking what he caught in this picture. It's as though he... You know, the primitives that I was around years ago in the islands used to say, don't take my picture, we think you're stealing our soul. I think they're right. Well, he caught some of my soul. Will they buy the book just on a picture and the name, God, Faith, and Reason? I don't know. Will impulse buyers buy it? Look, one thing I want to tell you is this, and it's important for you to hear this. I am not a missionary. I am not a theologian. I am not a phony preacher trying to get you into my church. I'm not at all. All I can say is this, as I said many times on the show. We've gone from a time when St. Christopher medals were seen on cars in America to dream catchers in one generation. When I was a kid, it seemed as though every other car in New York City had a Catholic owner. They had little St. Christopher statues on a dashboard. Myself, I didn't have one, but I liked that there were people who believed in God. It gave me faith to look across in the other car and see there were faithful people. One day I wake up, it was post-Obama, and now there were dream catchers hanging off mirrors. In San Francisco, there are so many things hanging off mirrors, I don't know how people can see through, see through their windshields. Mirrors, beads, voodoo things. There is voodoo paraphernalia hanging off automobile mirrors, and the country is melting down. It's total anarchy. As the third world invades us with their primitive magic, the country is melting down. And so what I'm trying to get at with my, with my show every day, with my book, is that none of us lasts forever. You see, there's an hourglass. You turn an hourglass upside down and you watch the sand trickle through. Well, in my case, and I'm not trying to pull a tearjerker on you, there's more sand on the bottom than there is on the top. Now, there was a time when there was more sand on the top than on the bottom. And I thought I had unlimited time to do everything. I actually thought I was immortal. In many ways, when I was young, I thought I was that ancient Greek figure who could fly right near the sun and into the sun without getting burned. But let me tell you right now, nobody can. We, we can't. No one can. What I'm saying to you is this. My last book, Trump's War, was a bestseller. Number one, I'll repeat it over and over again. Number one, Trump's War. Number one, New York Times without any television appearances. You know why? Because of you. Just think of the power you have. Just think of the power you have. Fundamentally, you have all the power. You elected a president. Yes, I know he's being attacked. No matter what he does, he shook his hands, they attacked that. He smiled, they attacked that. Now that faithless piece of garbage, John McCain, stabs him in the back. Again stabbed him in the back today, McCain. It's beyond comprehension what that man became. You've got to understand something, and it's important for you to know this. When I was down and out, I had to go down to the core of my being and reach out to the man upstairs, to put it colloquially. I had to reach out to the man upstairs, and I had to ask him to save me. But it didn't happen like a boom went off or a lightning struck or Charlton Heston appeared in my living room with a ticket to eternity. He didn't give me a ticket to ride. I had to keep asking God for it, and it took me 25 years to climb out of that hole. Did you hear me? 25 years, 25 years of fighting, 25 years of struggling, not 25 minutes, not 25 days, not two and a half days, 25 years I had to fight to get where I am. You see, God helps those who help themselves. He doesn't give you anything. By reaching out to God, maybe you can help yourselves. When Moses parted the Red Sea, the Jews entered the promised land. But guess what? They had to fight for it to gain the promised land. All God did was open it up for them. Then the Lord caused to rain upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities, and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew up upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19, 24 to 26. 
as quoted on page 97 of God, Faith, and Reason. You see, I salted, <laughs> I salted my text with Old Testament sayings set out in the text. For many people who have not looked at the Bible in their entire life, I want them to see the original language, the old wisdom. You say, well, what does that have to do with thing? I, I'm on Facebook. I own Google stock. I'm worth $12 billion. What the hell do you know? Jeremiah said, and I brought you into a land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. When you, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. What does that mean? I'll let you figure it out. I'm not God. I'm only a man. I'm not going to read the whole book to you today, but I'm going to read from the book. None of us lasts forever, as I said to you. And you have to struggle for what you want. And as you well know, I'm not a perfect man. I don't always practice what I preach. It doesn't make me a hypocrite. It makes me a man. For example, I occasionally eat high-fat cheese, even though I've written health books once a year. Twice a year, I'll eat a hot dog. Twice a year, I'll eat a steak. Hamburger with Teddy on Saturday. Took him to a restaurant, hamburger and fries. I've been gone all week, hadn't seen my dog. I took him out for a hamburger. I enjoyed myself. Even though I know it's poison for me, I ate it. We all do things we know aren't good for us but we do them anyway. It's the same spiritually, right? Isn't it true? Well, turn to the ancients. I can't live for the next world. I don't even know if there is a next world. This is the only earth I know of, and this earth is the only heaven I know of. This is also the only hell I know of. But I figure that if this stuff has worked for others for thousands of years, there must be something to it. Are all those millions stupid? Are they all idiots, I ask on page four of God, Faith, and Reason? This book is more about questions and a quest, an odyssey, rather than a, prof uh, a prophecy. An odyssey rather than a prophecy. Yesterday, after my trip to L.A., I don't know what happened, but I woke up with such pains in my lower legs. I I'm a very healthy man, thank God. Stubborn as a mule and very, 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 very stubborn as a mule. And I don't have too many problems, I'll be honest with you, physical. I woke up with terrible pains in my, like shin pains. I got scared. I thought it was neuropathy. My PhD was in neurop about neuropathy, and I said, oh, this is nerve. This is not good. I was going to see a phlebotomist. I was going to see a neuromuscular specialist. I was going to see this osteomist. And that, but that, but that, but. So I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, hold on. These pains, let's be logical about it. Shin pains, lower legs. Why? What did you do that's different? I couldn't figure it out. But then I remembered something. A friend of mine had told me years ago to get magnesium oil. You're not going to believe this. From the ancient Zechstein seabed, <laughs> super concentrated solution. Now, I've used alternative medicines all my life, or I wouldn't be here. I've kept my family and I healthy my whole life so far, thank God. And so he said, I'll try this stuff. Who knows? I swear to God, I spray this stuff on my lower legs. Within minutes, the pain went away. I didn't even have to put it back on. So what is that? What is it? It's ancient knowledge in a physical form that I use. That's what homeopathy is. That's what nutrition is. That's what a herbal medicine is. That's what all these alternative healing modalities are. It's ancient wisdom. This is not to say that modern medicine is not wise. It has tremendous wisdom. But there's a place for the ancient as well. You don't throw it all out. In order to take in the new, you don't throw out the old. It's, you know, and, 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 and. It's not, you don't throw out. You take it along with you. And that's what my book is. I try to collect the, the wisdom of the ages. So I have a chapter on loss, for example. A lot of people I write are in pain right now. Everyone has lost something, either dear to them or that they believed in. People react differently to loss. For example, we see the madness of the progressives expressing their election loss with violence and hatred. Page 187. What is loss but losing that which you once possessed or thought you possessed? Consider what loss is. What has been the greatest loss in your life? How did you cope with it? Be it of a loved one, a business, your pride, your dignity, your job, your promotion, your health? It's an interesting question to me because loss is part of life. Everyone thinks they're only going to win. They think that every time they throw the dice, they're going to win. They're not. They're not going to win on every throw. And a parent who raises a child to think they're only going to win is doing that child a tremendous disservice. And Job spoke and said, 
Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night wherein it was said a man-child is brought forth. Let that day be darkness. It reminds me of the great poet A.E. Hausman, who wore black on his birthday right until his old age. He cursed the day he was born because he was in pain from the day he was born. He suffered, but he didn't kill himself. He, he walked on that glass. He walked on that hot coal, but he did not kill himself and take the easy way out. He suffered through his whole life, as most people do. You're not alone if you're suffering. You know, maybe you watch the ads and you think everyone in the ad is real. They're not real. They're fake. They're as fake as the people in the news business. They're as fake as the pancake makeup. They're as fake as Joe Biden. They're as fake as Hillary Clinton. Everything is a fraud. So what is real? I'll let you figure it out. Now, i got to take a couple of calls because I'm in one of those states of mind where I can go like this for five hours in a row. I'm going to take a call, and then I'm going to take a call, then I'm going to take a call. Genevieve on line nine. You're up on the Savage Nation from WABC in New York. Go ahead, please. Hi, Dr. Savage. I just want to tell you, when you were entertaining your, your brother, just remember you were entertaining God, because God sent that little boy to you, even though he was in pain and you, know, you never could hear him speak. But when you whistled, he, his eyes light, lit up, you said. So just get consolation in that, because he was there for you. Even though it was so painful for your mom, and I, my heart aches for her. I have a well, I don't want to make the whole book and the whole show about my poor brother. He's dead and buried. He's been gone a long time. He's in a cold grave site on Long Island. He's been there since 1970. I'd rather leave that alone. It's too painful for me. I only mention that's part of the book. It's not the whole book. But i got to tell you something. It was the seminal formation of my life living with that little boy. And uh, all I can say is if he was alive today, he wouldn't have been thrown into uh, the Willowbrook Mental Hos State Hospital in, 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 in Staten Island where he suffered like you could not believe. Imagine the worst mental hospital in the world where people beat each other up, where they defecate on themselves. If I ever told you the stories, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to walk after the show. I can't tell you what my mother lived through. And the point is, is I don't want to talk about it. We've come so far in the treatment of the mentally handicapped that we should thank ourselves that we're such a modern, great society. Really, that's the main thing. And I'm sending you a copy of God, Faith, and uh, Reason. Share it with someone who is faithless and soulless out there. KSFO Online, Luke, line six. Go ahead, please. Hi, doctor. I just, I, I wanted to talk about uh, when, you, when, when you quoted that Job scripture, you're not going to believe it. I was reading in Job as you said that, literally. And uh, I was reading just ahead of that. Um, well, I want to make a point. I am, not, I am not a religious fanatic, nor do I want to sit here and quote the Bible. I'd rather just talk about the narrative of the book rather than the Bible itself. You know what I'm saying? So what, what else struck you here? Well, you know, I was just, that was just such a wonderful scripture. And, um, you know, All right, let's move on. I, you see, here's the problem. Here is the problem. All of you Bible-loving people, God bless all of you, and I hope you pick up the book and look at it and get something from it for someone who doesn't believe like you do. But I aim this book at the person who's not a Bible expert or, not, or a Bible reader. It's aimed for the general audience that read Trump's War or Scorched Earth or Stop the Coming Civil War. That's who it was aimed at. It's not a preachy book. You'll have to see it until you get it tomorrow. You won't know. WABC Morris, line five. Go ahead, please. Hi, Dr. Savage. I just wanted to tell you I've worked with developmentally disabled adults, and it was really touching what you mentioned, and I heard really, really terrible stories about folks who had relatives who had uh, uh, relatives in those, in those institutions back in the day. Uh, thank God, though, now uh, people are treated much, much better, um, and they really have lives now, and... I, think was... I want to ask you something. Morris, I want to ask you something. My poor brother was said to be brain dead. I know he wasn't because when I whistled, his eyes lit up. A boy like that today, would he be at all cognitive in a wheelchair with ele electrical impulses being used for him to communicate? Is that how it would work? Not at all. Not at all. People are, there's a lot more respect uh, given to, to clients. And... No, no, I didn't ask you about respect and treatment. I asked you if he would be... Would he be able to communicate that type of poor, damaged person today? I, I believe so. I believe so. There's so many more techniques now um, that it's just... It's... Well, like in Berkeley, across the bay, I see many handicapped people in wheelchairs. They're totally immobilized. But because of the electronics of today, 
they're mobile. They're actually, they can move themselves around in a wheelchair. It's amazing how far technology has come. It really is. It really is. Well, how do you work with people like this without getting depressed? Because, believe it or not, um, there's, there's a sense of reward when you're, when you're helping people. And, you know, you, you, most people who work in this field, they give of themselves, um, and there's no any, uh, it's altruistic mostly, um, because they care. It's just about caring. There's no, there's no, there's no um, superficial reason, that, you know, reason for working in this field. You, you, well, have what, you have a developmentally disabled child who can hardly move, and you work with that child, and you take care of that child. You get a pleasure out of helping the child, is what you're saying? Uh, yes. The rec care workers who do, who do work day-to-day -day with, um, with, with clients, they do have a tremendous reward, and it's very rewarding working with it. It's, it's really... No, that's a, they're all saintly. They're all saints. I'm going to send you a copy of God, Faith, and Reason. Share it with someone who doesn't have your uh, sense of sensibilities, okay? 855-400-7282. Uh, Could we not just get stuck on my poor brother? I mean, it's such only a part of the book. I understand it's emotional, and believe me, I'm so happy that you're calling. But I don't want to only talk about that because I think you'll get depressed. It isn't only about that. Does God exist? Part one. Part two, God in nature. Part three, scriptures. Part four, God in country. That's the political. Part five, God in man. And you'll see something in there. Some of these pieces are a page long. Some are a half a page long. Some are 10 pages long. You can pick this book up anywhere, and you can read it for five minutes or two hours. They're all self-standing. I know in a bookstore, sometimes I go in, I'll pick a book up and start it flipping around. If it doesn't catch me in the middle, I put it down. I've always written my books to be classics, where you can pick it up at any page and get in, pulled into that book. You get it? And that's what this is. And so I hope that you get something out of this, but... I want to reemphasize re something. Uh, is it for the religious, per se? I don't think that any of the Orthodox Jews who listen to me are going to buy this book. I don't think any of the fundamentalist Christians who read the New Testament every day, religiously, so to speak, are going to buy this book. And yet it's number you know, it's been number one for over four weeks now on the religious books and number one on the Christian books, so maybe I'm wrong. I'm a little down right now on this book. Do you know why? Because zero publicity. Nobody wants to know anything about it. So you say, is God dead? Do they not want to touch this book around the holiday season? All the pancake made up men and women in the media? They don't want to touch it because it says God in the title? Well, my answer to that is simple. God is not dead. Man is dead to God, mainly in the media. Man is dead to God in the media. And my new book invites you, the skeptics, to take the spiritual odyssey with me. Okay? Now a talk radio host known to defy conventional commercial broadcast wisdom by, I know I'm running late. I know, I know I'm running late. I, I know I'm running late. I have no sense of time right now because I'm a timeless guy. I'll be right back. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. You know I have never endorsed a pain reliever before. I don't, but... I'm endorsing Relief Factor because I've studied and even written about the four ingredients in it. Well, you ask who should consider ordering Relief Factor. Basically, anyone with pain that is keeping them from doing things that bring joy to their life, taking walks without pain or riding a bike or playing golf again without pain, even getting out of bed every morning without pain. And, and no, of course, there are no guarantees, but I know you could very possibly be helped like the thousands of other listeners who have been helped just by ordering the three-week Quick start from Relief Factor for just nineteen ninety five. period. $20 is too much for you, then you must not be in too much pain. But if pain is keeping you from doing the things you love to do, a $20 investment to see if you can lower or eliminate your pain is not much at all. So try the three-week quick start only at relieffactor.com. You heard me, relieffactor.com. We are almost out of time. I don't think I have more than a minute or two, I guess, right now. The first hour is almost gone. I'm at KSFO Studios here in San Francisco. Of course, I am talking about my new book, which is not called Satan, Doubt, and Idiocy by Cycle Maggage. No, the book is not called Satan, Doubt, and Idiocy. And it was not written by Cycle Maggage. The book is called God, Faith, and Reason, written by yours truly, Michael Savage. And I'm using a little bit of a game here to get you to remember the fact that a plastic mind is a mind too good to waste. 
Welcome to the Savage Nation. I'll be back in an, uh, oh, in a bit now, and we'll talk about Icarus, the boy who flew too close to the sun, and don't throw out the old for the new. Sometimes the old wisdom is the only wisdom. I will read to you from God, Faith, and Reason and all the news, views, and reviews, inc including the new witch hunt, the sexual assault accusations that are now flying in every direction except in the right direction. Wait until you see when it starts flying at the lawyers themselves who are bringing the charges. That is the day I am waiting for, when all of the high and mighty hypocritical lawyers who are destroying lives on merely saying Jack Hughes, when suddenly someone comes out of their closet and says, but wait a minute, she assaulted me. That's the day I'm waiting for. Maybe then they could write their book. All the wonderful lawyers destroying lives can write their book, Satan, Doubt, and Idiocy. This is the Savage Nation. Be here or be nowhere. Back, I have a good 18 seconds to burn up here. I'm working here without my second, uh, my egg timer here in the Savage Nation. I will, I will come back in a few seconds uh, after the top of the hour break. I'm having a good time, believe it or not. And I hope you'll join me for the next hour on the Savage Nation. E. Now will be the win. <laughs> That's what we're living through now. Many ways I uh, have been on the outside so long, it's starting to look like the inside to me. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. I'm a reclusive guy. Ask anyone who knows me. I rarely socialize. When I do, it's very selective. And mainly my dog, my family, and that's about it. I feed uh, old bread to the seagulls. I read a lot. I think a lot about uh, the eternal thing, you know, the eternal questions that man thinks about, which is what does it all mean? What are we doing here? Is there an afterlife? And I've been this way since I'm five years old. It's not like something new. I didn't suddenly slap a new suit on to match the book, God, Faith, and Reason. It's the way I've been since I've been a child. And when I wrote Trump's War, I did a deal with my publisher. And I said, I will write Trump's War on a crash schedule with you only if you agree to publish my God book. At the time, it had no title. And they said, okay, we'll do it. Well, here it is. Here it is. It's born. It'll be in the stores tomorrow. It's the end of a long road. Uh, and... Uh, it was supposed to be called God's War. Would you believe that? I originally was going to call this book God's War. And then a friend of mine, I'll tell you right now, straight up front, a friend of mine says to me, Michael, you just did a war book. You did Stop the Coming Civil War. You did Trump's War. You, you know, you're, you're typecasting yourself. He said, why don't you do what Clint Eastwood did when he shifted from his Dirty Harry roles to the bridges of Madison County? So I came up with God, Faith, and Reason. And... You know, from the bottom of my soul, I must tell you something. I believe this book is going to be um, a groundbreaker for me, whether it sells a lot or a little. I don't know. That's up to you, not up to me. But it doesn't matter because the story will be there from the beginning to the end, from when I was a little boy chasing papers in the street because I thought it was a holy grail running down the street instead of old newspaper. I think I told you that story last week. I'll read it to you a little later. Good little story about the kid, this foolish kid who I became a man from, me, who chased the newspaper down the street in the Bronx when I was four or five years old. It was blowing in the wind, Bobby. News sheets were blowing in the wind down Longfellow Avenue, and I didn't know what it was, but it was written in the language that I thought was the language of my ancestors in some ancient script called Yiddish or Hebrew. I didn't know what it meant even. I couldn't read it, but I said, oh, my God, that's holy stuff. So like a little kid does, I ran after those newspaper sheets and gathered them up as they were rolling down the street in the ball. I brought them home to my mother, and I said, Mom, Mom, look what I, look what I did. Look what I found. And she, she kind of chuckled. She said, it's okay, Michael. It's only a newspaper. So what does that mean? What do I know what it means? I don't know what it means. Maybe God needed some entertainment that day. Maybe he wanted a little kid to run down the street and grab newspapers. I don't know why. What do I know what it means? It's a good story, and it's true. That's the whole point, is it's all true. In this book, um, God, Faith, and Reason, I have another story I want to read to you. It's one, two pages long that I think will tell you a little bit more about me, and it'll lead you back to what I just said to you, which is that this book is going to change my life. I can't divulge what is coming because I truly don't know what is coming. Most men half my age have already given up on their life. They've already settled into the fact that they're not going to make anything in their life. They're going to live it through to the pension. They're going to work it out the best way they can. 
and they're going to do as you know as little as they can at their job, collect the check and go on with their life and you know pass on. I've never been that way. I'm still fighting. I'm still punching. I'm still trying to break through this kind of membrane. I don't even know why. If you forced me to say, why are you still fighting so hard when you have so much? Why are you still struggling? What are you trying to prove? I would say that I'm living for two lives. I told you that earlier. I said it before, and I want to overplay it again. I'm living for me, and I'm living for my brother who never lived. So that's what I'm trying to say. So for him, I feel this book, God, Faith, and Reason, is going to open up a whole new world for me. I believe that I am going to have a new career, not as an evangelist. I'm not going to get a church and do that. God bless him for doing that. I don't mean that, but I'm going to go down the road of an inspirational career. I'm leaving politics not behind, but it's not going to be the set or the frame. It's going to be in the background. It's not that politics are unimportant, but it's not the only thing on earth. You see what I'm saying? Long before politics and long after politics, there are still there are still the eternal questions that we all ask, which are the questions of existence. You understand that? And and that's what I'm trying to say is that I hope to lead people out of the well, just out of the abyss of not knowing where the heck they're at and to find their own promised land inside themselves. Because it's not through me. It's not me doing this. I'm only a vehicle. Do you understand that? Do I make sense to you? It's not Michael doing it. It's not Michael doing it. It's coming through me at you. And that's what this book is. It's a door. Lonesome Boy on Cold Sand, page 169 of God, Faith, and Reason. Do I have time to read this, Jim, Robert? I don't know where I'm at. I'm, I'm in a new studio. I can't even follow the clock. Picture a boy about 11 years old, thin, small, walking alone, aimlessly on a cold beach in the middle of the winter in Rockaway, New York. No one is around. The boardwalk is empty. The hotels are silent. What is the boy doing wandering almost like a bumblebee who'd been sprayed with raid in the sand? I was that boy. You see, inside one of the hotels on that wintry day, there was a father and son Boy Scout dinner. It was on a Sunday, I believe, and I had attended it. But my father worked seven days a week in his little store trying to put bread on the table, pay the rent, pay the car bills. So he wasn't with me. I was always alone. I had no father in that regard. He had to work, and I understood that. But it seemed to me that all the other boys had fathers with them, and they were happy at that dinner. It suddenly dawned on me in the middle of that dinner that I had no father, at least not when I needed him. I still remember almost running out of that room on my own, almost in a daze, and disappearing onto the sand, the cold sand and walking by myself. I didn't know where I was going. I don't think I was going to walk into the ocean to kill myself. But I really don't know for sure what I was going to do. I don't know what was in the mind of that 11-year-old boy in the sand. But I do know that out of nowhere there came the scout leader and a few other men looking for me. I turned around and there they were, those kind men. There was Mr. Aronson. He didn't yell at me. He didn't scream and demand, where were you? What are you doing? As my father would have done. He was a kind man and he reached out to me and took me in his arm. And then he took me back into the dinner and I felt that I had just been protected. In many ways, the story is a great metaphor for those of us who are wandering like lost souls, seeking our Father, or more importantly, our Father in Heaven. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back. Uh, in San Francisco, Tony, you left your barf in San Francisco. No, I really do love this city. Uh, I have some gripes with it, as you well know. The socialists who took it over have destroyed it completely by letting the... Well, let's let it go. I don't even want to go there. I can't take it. Right now, there's a trial for the bum, the illegal alien who shot Kate Steinle. You should see what they're doing here. They're making her into the, the villain. You hear this? And the poor illegal alien, who has like six last names from his home country. How come they have six names? Motive elusive as jurors sift facts. This is the best they can do in this sick newspaper. You know, sympathy for the devil would be uh, more closer to it. Jose Inez Garcia Zarate shot Kate Steinle and killed her. But the illegal alien is being represented by the entire city who says, well, we should acquit this case because the single bullet that bounced before it struck Kate was, was improbable. It was accidental. And they don't even want a manslaughter charge. You see, Garcia Zarate's attorneys want the whole case thrown out. This is the city I live in. 
where you can kill someone and get away with it if you're on the right side or the wrong side. Anyway, this is the Savage Nation. Time is a marching on. The big hand is on 21. The little hand is on one out here. Remember how my mother taught me how to tell time? Remember your mother telling you how to tell time? Tell time? Okay, the little hand is on the one. The big hand is on the 21. What time is it, Audrey? Of course, if you're on the East Coast, the little hand is on the four. And the big hand is on the 21. Your mother taught you how to, how to read time. Your mother taught you probably how to make a tie. Your mother taught you how to uh, wipe yourself. Your mother taught you how to brush your teeth. Your mother taught you how to dance. Your mother did all these things for you, and you now laugh at mother. You're living in a brave new world, aren't you? You know more than your mother did, so you think. Do you know more than your mother did? Do you know more than your father did? Were they just two quaint old people who went to church? Are you sure that they knew nothing? You think that because they didn't have an iPhone, they were dumb? You think that because they couldn't access a website, they were stupid? Well, I touch on this in God, Faith, and Reason. And I talk about being a teenager myself at one point and not knowing who I was, as most teenagers today don't know who they are. But they're sure that they know everything except who they are. They don't even want to know who they are. They don't want to read ancient literature. They think that if it was not written by someone of a certain particular authentic ethnicity, it has no validity. Well, I will remind you who built this world that you live in. And I will remind you over and over again, be very, very careful before you throw out everything and reject everything that you think is old for the new. Because the old wisdom may be the only way for us going forward. Sometimes the old wisdom is the only wisdom. Now, I myself do not read the Bible as a literal text. I will be very clear with you from the beginning. I've said that before. I'm not a biblical realist or biblical absolutist. If I were, I would have to be a murderer. I would have to join ISIS. If I were a biblical absolutist, do you understand what I just said to you? Has anyone ever said that to you? Anyone with the pancake makeup and the perfect tie? If, if I were a biblical absolutist, I'd have to join ISIS. Start killing people and torturing people and say, God told me to do it. But that's why I'm not a biblical absolutist. And yet, there is such truth and beauty in the Old Testament. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of embalming. And the Egyptians... The Egyptian, Egyptians wept for him three score and ten days. That's in Genesis 50-1. If you think that you're one of these people who are above it all, I will remind you. <laughs> what do I have to remind you? What do I have to remind you what you don't already know? You have not escaped the zoological order. It's the way of all flesh. And one day, I think all people listening to this show, no matter how bright, no matter how smart, will come to understand that they're not alone in this world. I think that's all I want to say right now about God, faith, and reason. There'll be more coming this week. There's some big shocking stories coming out this week. I suggest you pay close attention to some of the major, major websites to see what I'm talking about, and you'll see where this goes. It's starting very, very slowly because there's been a media blackout. Once again, one bestseller after another. It's unheard of. Five in a row, still not seen on television. There's a reason for that. One day we'll find out who is blocking me and why they are blocking me, and it will be fall upon that person to explain to their own followers why they were doing it and how that does not match with the, uh, let us say, story they've been telling the world about themselves. But I'll leave that to fate. I learned a long time ago there was an evil person in my family. I never told this story, but it's in my book. There was a purely evil person in my family, but most charming, the most charming person you've ever met. As some evil people are so charming, it's hard to believe. Everyone fell under this person's spell. Well, as time went on, he was an inveterate gambler and a little bit of a gangster. He robbed from everybody in the family with false investments. He put it into stocks that didn't even exist. And when the poor people in my family went to collect the money he said they were making, there was no money there. He was a little mini Madoff type. Well, he took my mother's life savings. I think it was not a lot of money, but to her it was $75,000 which 30 years ago was a lot of money. She was waiting to retire. Not She never retired. She was waiting to live on it with the little house my father left her. You know, and money I could give her whatever, Social Security, she was going to get by. 
Well, she loved this guy. She loved him more than me because he was so damn charming. He'd go in restaurants and people would fall all over themselves. He was so cool. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know the type. The hot shot type. You know the type. Took her for every penny. Took my uncle. Took me for some money, too. My mother begged me to get even with him. She looked at me. She said, you got to do something. I said, Ma, listen to me. Turn to God for vengeance. Don't turn to me. Now, you may say I was cowardly, but I'm not an Old Testament kind of guy. I don't take the Old Testament literally. You hear what I just said to you? I had faith that God would eventually punish this man, and believe me, punish me, punish him, he did. He punished him. He broke him. He wound up in jail without a penny. He wound up a broken man living nowhere, nowhere, doing nothing with his life. He never apologized to anyone in the family that he robbed. He was still the hot shot when you went out with him. He thought he was a hot shot, you know, still playing the, uh, the Little Italy game. But let me tell you something. I leave vengeance to God, whether it's that case or any other case in my life. Every one, I've, I've seen it happen before. I don't know how it's happened. I don't know why it's happened. You say, how does it happen? I've seen it in business. I've seen it in my personal life. Everyone who has gone out of their way to hurt me has been hurt much worse by fate and by God. I don't know how it happens. And sometimes it took 15 years for it to happen. But every one of them was damaged. Every one of them was punished by fate or by God, not by me. I didn't have to lift a finger, even though I wanted to lift one finger, the finger that pulls the old S and W. But I didn't do that because I'm not a murderer. I'm not an Old Testament man. I may have the rage of an Old Testament man. I may have the passion of an Old Testament man. I may have the love for life of an Old Testament man. But I am not a herder. I'm a healer. And all of that is in God, faith, and reason. And you could see why it's not really a book about Bible or prophecy, even though that's all over the book. It's about real life 101. Maybe, just maybe, you can save your son or your daughter from a life of drugs or a life of crime or a life of loss or a life of depression by giving them a copy. Just Savage Nation, welcome back. Your favorite voice, the voice you all wait for every day. It's true. If you're listening to the show, you can't wait for me to talk. It's like a vacuum when I'm not on the air. I know that. So I'm going to look at the Drudge Report for a minute. Poll, Trump jumps to 46% approval. Tax cuts getting close, and there's the Prez over there. Uh, I don't know which uh, Philippines, where he is now, Indonesia. I'm knowing drinking, having a good time, been away for a year. The whole world fell apart, then it got rebuilt. Here he is, did well, jumped up. People liked him away. His numbers went up while he was away rather than down. Maybe he should stay away longer. Maybe he shouldn't come back. Maybe he should stay another three months. Maybe he should take another trip every week, come home for a week, leave for a month. So on the top it says, Washington Post, drudge links to Russians. Can you believe this? Can you believe how devious they're getting? That because the drudge report is linking to stories about Russia and also to the Washington Post and hundreds of other publications, what, they're conspiring now with Russia? Sick. You know the Drudge Report had 1.47 1. billion page views? 1.4 billion. That's the equivalent of 47 views of the Drudge Report every second of every minute that month. It's the second most visited website, which means that the Drudge Report had more page views than Yahoo, Disney, which includes ABC and ESPN, ESPN and Time Warner. Drudge had more than the New York Times and the Washington Post combined with enough space left over to outpace Hearst. Can you believe that? And so now one of the main competitors to the Drudge Report is Amazon. Amazon owns the Washington Post. You talk about interlocking corporate directorships. Well, now the Washington Post owner is trying to attack him. Do you get how this works? It's unbelievable to me. Let's take some calls on the Savage Nation. Phone number is 855 Four hundred seven two eight two. Let's fly over to New York City on WABC Dino Line Five. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind? Hey, Michael. I heard what you were saying about growing up as a kid with no father. My dad was in the bread business, seven days a week, nights and weekends. Never came to the ball games. But the people mm. are my set of Boy Scouts with the boys, the Gambino people, the Genovese people. They always watched out for uh, for me to make sure I walked a straight line and all. Uh, and mm. 
by my father working that hard and these people watching out for me defined me in life. Not that I went on the wrong track, they set me on the right track. And those people Let me ask you something. Forgot. I, I want to ask you something. You, your life sounds like that in the movie A Bronx Tale, right? Yep, that's when my, I grew up. Where, like, his father was a bus driver, and then he liked the guys on the corner with the sharp suits and the Cadillacs. Is that is that you as a kid? Yep, and my father always respected them, never did any business with them. No, that's an interesting way to put it, but he didn't do what the movie's version said, made believe he was going to stand up to them and tell, and tell them off because they wouldn't have done that. The no. reality is nobody would have done that. No, he, he no. would have... The Robert De Niro character was complete false, fake, just like Robert De Niro. No one would have done that to those wise guys. They wouldn't have lasted a day. No, definitely. So I, as a man yourself, without going into your life today, you're telling me more or less what you did and what you do and what you are. Do you have faith in God yourself? Yes, I do. And I heard exactly what you said. The people that go and they try and beat you for money, the ones that beat you the most, it may take a long, long time, but boy, do they get theirs. Point in case, <laughs> Father had two partners, Frankie and Steve. Th this past year, they died within 30 days of each other. Both partners, ex-partners, robbed from him. He finally got even because he's alive. <laughs> what you're saying is the vengeance was living. Yes. You're saying the vengeance was outliving the, 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 the rotten partners. That's right, and he, as long as you had faith and stood the course, it comes through. It took a long time, but he's smiling all the way, my father. <laughs> so he, he enjoyed the fact that he outlived his enemies in plain English. Oh, yeah. I want to ask you something. You, you grew up in New York in the Bronx in the Italian community, right, up there? Correct, Arthur Avenue, 187th Street. Arthur Avenue. I, I, I for a minute forgot it. I had relatives up there. I don't remember them anymore. It was a long distant time ago. Were you a church-going family? I mean, your father was a hard worker, seven. Did he actually go to church on Sunday? Mount Carmel Church. So even though he worked his behind off seven days a week, he found time to pray. Why do you think he did that, in your opinion? Why do you think he did that? Well, you got to have faith in something. You're looking for Bingo. That's what my mother said. My mother used to say it to me when I was a kid, and I was a doubtful college student, and I came home with the poison in my head. And I would say, there is no God. What are you going to do with this religion? She says, Michael, you got to believe in something. And I, I figured it out. She's right. And so even the people who say they don't believe in anything, they're actually believing in nothing. He, he quit school at eighth grade, uh, eighth grade. I don't even think he went to Roosevelt. So he grew up in the street. That's like my father. My father went to the eighth grade, the same thing. Pretty yep. interesting. My father's your age. He's 75. I want to say 76. That's not my age. I'm 39, like Jack Benny. Yeah, Jack Benny says the same thing. Quotes him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sound like a great guy. I'd love to sit down one day and have some scongealing with you, but no one sells it anymore. You know, I was in Los Angeles last week. There's a restaurant up there in Beverly Hills. The guys are from New Jersey. They're the only ones who still sell scongealing. I tried it. I got to tell you the truth. It was better than that product they sell in a pill. It's funny, you go and eat the Italian food. My father's in Boynton Beach. He goes to see Carl Pector over at Flakowitz to get a corned beef on rye. This is the fun. Because <laughs> it reminds him of his childhood. That's really funny. You're a, you're a great caller. I'm, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you're a regular listener. You must like the show a little bit, right? A little? A lot. I want to ask you something. And, you know, this is like a self-serving question. I have no feedback unless I get realists like you to answer me. So today I'm talking about my book, God, Faith, and Reason, and of course I'm going to send you a copy. Do you think I'm talking too much about it because I'm interspersing stories that are in the book and from my life and reading from the book? Do you think I'm doing too much or about the right amount? You're not doing enough because I'm tired of hearing Trump. I turn you off. Oh, 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 I'm tired of hearing about the politics. I, I got a headache. It's enough. This is a refreshing conversation. It's a refreshing show. I think you should make politics one day a week and four days a week about everything else. Health, wellness, another day. Uh, God, faith, and religion, another day. Sports, another day. And pick something else. You know, you're right. I, mean, I said to you this book is a, is a portal or a door to my future, not only in radio, but also in another medium that I can't talk about, where I'm going to actually do that kind of show. I'm tired of it already. Every day, one band of crooks saying this about that one, and the judge Moore, and this one white trash said this. 
he didn't do it, he did do it, he touched her, he didn't touch her, and then the vicious lawyers. How much can people take of this crap? Same bullshit, back and forth. I feel like a ball at a match. Boom, 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 boom. It's insane. I hope they I hope they censored the word S off that word bull. He got yeah, he got you there. He got the bull but he got the bull but not the S. That's good. Chester. I don't give a you know what. Let me ask you something. I want, this is a funny topic for me. Do you still live in New York? I live in Purchase, New York. Purchase, that's what, just outside north? Yeah, Harrison, outside of White Plains, twenty miles north of the city. So what do you do for food? You go crazy or you have to come down to to the Bronx to eat? Uh, you go, you go to the Bronx. The new the new Arthur Avenue is actually Whole Foods, but you go oh. to Zoe's. Great place. You remember the movie The Godfather when they go to Lewis's restaurant up in the Bronx? You remember that? Yep. Was there such a restaurant like that where he says, "Oh, it's the perfect place. It's Lewis's, it's a family place. Everyone minds their business." Is there actually such a restaurant? There was no nothing like that for real, was there? I think so. The closest thing was a place uh, called Dominic's, very family style. You sat right next to a stranger. You ate dinner. You probably caught some of his sauce or whatever. <laughs> my kind of place, you know, wherever I go to eat, I got to wear a bib. I can't help it. I ruin my clothing. And if I put it on my chest, it's a nightmare. I get it on my sleeve. If I cover the sleeve, I get it on my shoe. That. I went to Alioto's seafood restaurant down in San Francisco. I haven't been there for years, but I went back. I made up with the guys, you know me. Two years good, then two years bad. So I went back. It was such a great meal. So they gave me a seafood bib, and I swear to God, I thought I was good. I looked in the mirror. The, the $300 shirt was still good. Bingo. I look at the cuff, a red sauce. I can't. And my, my wife, my parents, everybody says, no matter when you go out, you always get something on your thing, and I'm always dabbling, dabbing it in the, the seltzer water. You know, the Bernie... <laughs> right, the old trick. The old Perrier or the, the soda water, the uh, Pellegrino, it helps a little bit. Anyway, you're a good sport. God, faith, and reason goes out to you. It's listeners like you that make the show worth doing, to be honest with you. It is it's a pleasure. Let's see what it is, right? No, it is my pleasure. You know that the, uh, the little hand... Well, the big hand is on 43, almost 44 already. I have to say the big hand because that's 44 around the country and around the world. If I give you the little hand, you'll only know where I am on the West Coast, so... The big hand is at 44. I'll be right back. This is the Savage Nation. It is the Savage Nation. Oh, I almost forgot this, but I can't forget this. Because without this, there is no me. I'll bet you don't spend much time thinking about your circulation, but you should. Why? Because good circulation is crucial to energy and stamina. It gets oxygen and nutrients flowing throughout your body. So you can exercise longer, do more everyday activities, and recover more quickly. And what can you do to promote healthy circulation? As I told you, drink Super Beats. Super Beats promotes the body's own natural ability to produce healthier circulation for increased energy and stamina all day long. Only Super Beats is made from beets grown to exacting standards, and then they are concentrated into superfood crystals. Listen to me. If you want to improve your circulation, you just call 800-481-0504, 800-481-0504, or go to savagelovesbeats.com. And with your first order, you're going to get another 30-day supply for free, plus indicator strips to see how Super Beats is working for you, and also free shipping. All you got to do is call 800-481-0504. Go to SavageLovesBeats.com. Now, I want to ask you something. Is it really Darwin's world? Is it really Darwin's world where the hawk kills the dove and the lion eats the gazelle? Is it Darwin's world where the strong destroy the weak? And the smart defeat the dull. Hmm. Is that the world we live in? Or has the world changed so that now the dove has more power than the hawk? And the gazelle has more power than the lion? And the weak now have more power than the strong? I don't have an answer to that question. I only have the faith to ask the question. Are you planning on buying God, Faith, and Reason and carrying it on the bus, subway, or displaying it in your office? Is this book going to be different than my political books where you won't be afraid to show it at work? I'm going to give you a savage challenge. If you buy the book, and I know many of you will, you're regular buyers of my books. You buy God, Faith, and Reason. There's no politics on it. It doesn't say Trump. It doesn't say Karl Marx. It doesn't say Hillary Clinton on it. Just a nice-looking guy with a striped shirt. And the title is God, Faith, and Reason, Michael Savage. Why don't you put this on your desk at work tomorrow 
Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and tell me the reactions that you're going to get. Or better yet, carry it on the subway, carry it on the bus, display it in your office, talk to people about the book and its message, and see how tolerant the liberals are when you say to them, wait a minute, this is not a political book. It's written by a guy who may be political, but it's not a political book. I don't care what he wrote. I don't like anything about him. Is that not a sign of bigotry and prejudice? Hmm? What are you hoping to get out of my book, God, Faith, and Reason, that you never got from anyone else's political books? How will you spread the message of this book to your liberal friends? Will you give it to someone when you are finished reading it? Well, there's a lot of other things that I'm going to ask you to do when you go to your local bookstore to find the book tomorrow. Were the employees in the store courteous? Did you get the negative looks and comments? Did they bury the book? Under uh, uh, Manny has two fathers. Okay, so that's some of the stuff that's going to be coming up tomorrow on the Savage Nation. Do I have time for a call here? I don't even know. I've lost all track of time. He had a little hand, the big, big hand. The big hand is on seven. That means I got a three minute on the uh, boom. Here we are. <laughs> I don't know which one to take. Is there a woman? I want a woman. Chrissy? Chrissy, line one. Chrissy, welcome to the program. Hi, just real quick. I wanted to say that I'm buying two copies of the book, one for me and my grandma, and then the other one I'm gifting to my son, who's not quite a believer and he's a little bit of a liberal. Um, I'm going to be gifting that to him for Christmas. I just wanted to call and say... Well, here, here's the thing about your son. Here's the thing about your son. I raise the questions and answer them for myself, not for him. He may see that his questions are the same as my questions and realize he's part of the continuum of life, that he's not the first one to cross the earth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I just think... And in that sense, <laughs> see, here's the thing. Most people think that their, their questions, their doubts, their, 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 their fears are, are only the first time on earth that it's been felt. Everyone goes through this. The toughest man on earth asks these questions of himself in the privacy of his own home, or else I don't think he's a full human. He's a half man. You know what I'm saying, Chrissy? Thank you for the call. A copy goes out to you. The phone number is 855-407-282. KSFO, line 7. Dan, fire away. What's on your mind? Uh, God gave me the faith to call you for this reason. I have a plan to take back Hollywood, but I need your help. I wrote an award-winning screenplay. It's a modern-day fairy tale that promotes traditional Judeo-Christian values. All right, thank you, but I'm not promoting your product on my show. You never should have gotten through the call screen, but he's busy smoking a Cuban cigar. No, he isn't. No one smokes in the studio. You can't call my show and promote stuff. Come on, man. That doesn't work. It's not fair. I worked for uh, 25, 50 years to get where I am. You know what I mean? Get online, Johnny. <laughs> Okay, well, where do I go from here? What do you want me to do? KBET, Ezekiel, line three. Let's try you. Line three on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Line three. God Almighty bless you, Michael Savage. Uh, I'm calling because I read every one of your books, and uh, they're prophetic. And I went to uh, researching uh, what the definition of a prophet is. And in the process, uh, I find that maybe you're a modern-day prophet. Uh, and I prayed to God about it, and he opened the Bible to Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1. Shalom to Ba'ah, my friend. I hear you, and may it go from your lips to God's ear, as we say in the Bronx, while munching on a Bialy. Anyone know the difference between a Bialy and a bagel? West Coast, they never heard of a Bialy. I never heard of it. It's just a Bialystok Poland thing. I'll tell you about it when I come back. It's beautiful to be here with you. Here I sit so many years later in the Savage Nation Studios, KSFO in this case, on hundreds of stations across America when it was just a dream to begin with. Just a dream. Think of what a dream can, you know, the old saying, you start with a dream and there you are in reality. It's many years later. This March will be from 1994. You do the math. I can't do it right now. The 2018, 24 years. 24 years in radio went by in the blink of an eye. Your mother was right. It went by in the blink of an eye. So here I am, one uh, best-selling book after another. No complaints. I have no complaints. At the end of the day, what have I got to complain about? Nothing. Nothing at all except this. It's the suffering in the world that is unnecessary. 
there is necessary suffering and then there's unnecessary suffering. For people to have so much and suffer is a true, I don't even want to use the word sin, but that really is a sin. If you have everything and you have nothing, what does that say about you? You know, there's an old saying, uh, what was it, the man has everything and he has nothing, he can't enjoy any of it. My mother used to say to me, remember, Michael, she said, health is more important than wealth. Why, Ma, we were poor. I don't know if she was just justifying the fact that she was healthy and didn't have any money, but she said, because without health, no matter how rich a man is, she would say to me, no matter how much money he has, if he loses his health, he can't enjoy his wealth and he has nothing. Well, I didn't understand that as a child. And so what does that actually mean? It means what you want it to mean. We're living in a spiritually empty world, a devoid world. It seems that some of the immigrant people have more faith than the native population does, if you want to ask me. Like, take a look who's in the churches. The Spanish people are. They still believe in God. Does it make them stupid, or does it make them like your parents and grandparents in that sense? I've been at the churches in the city on a Sunday. I've seen, for example, there's a little chapel on the wharf at Fisherman's Wharf, and the Sicilian fishermen used to go to that chapel when they went out to sea or came back from sea like clockwork. I'm talking in the old days when Joe DiMaggio's father had a little crab fishing boat. Those boats are still down there. Well, now the fishermen are not Italian. They're not Sicilian. They may be Guatemalan. They may be El Salvadoran. They may be Nicaraguan. They may be Mexican. And the chapel is still there. And I've been there on a Sunday on that little wharf early in the morning. And I've seen little girls in little dresses with the fathers and with the mothers and their siblings. And I see life going on and on and on. And you have to accept the fact that life changes and nothing remains the same. And I don't want to make it about politics right now or about who should be here and shouldn't be here. I don't even want to talk about it. I've done it so many times. I'll leave it to the others who haven't done it. You know, let them do it. Right now I want to talk about my book, God, Faith, and Reason, just for a minute. Skeptics will be taken on a spiritual, on a spiritual odyssey, on a mission to awaken America. Those are the headlines that are on michaelsavage.com, my little website that could. On the um, top of the website, you see that. And here's another story. You want to get political here? Here we go. Transracial man born white feels like he's Filipino. How far does this insanity go? I, excuse me. Transracial man born white feels like he is Filipino. So what, if he feels like it, he is? This is the insanity of those who lack reason. This is the insanity of those who lack reality. This is the insanity of our times. You want to see reality? Here's reality right next to the story of this feeling man who feels he's Filipino, so he thinks he is Filipino. Tell that to a real Filipino and see what they have to say to you. On the right side of that page on my website, real risk that black death plague will reach the United States, Europe, and Britain, disease expert warns. I warned you about it. I warned you about it when Obama's heads of the CDC and the NIH did not stop immigrants from, from Honduras bringing in Zika. And what did you call me, a racist at the time? And I said to you, I am not a racist, I am a realist. I'm trained in epidemiology. Keep them out. But Obama brought them in by the train load. Now I say keep out those with the black death. Block them at the airports. Don't let them in. And what am I being called? What will I be called by saying keep out those with plague? Well, I won't be called, but I should be called a wise man. But you moronic, stupid, progressive liberals who want open borders, do you think that de disease discriminates? Let me remind you of something. Disease does not discriminate. Viruses, bacteria, protozoans, they don't know who you are. They don't know you're such a good progressive. And they can kill you just as fast as they kill someone on the other side of the spectrum. You should be very seriously concerned about your stupidity and your lack of wisdom. And that's the opening to the show. The phone number here is 855-407-282. Now let's go to the callers around the nation and around the state. KPRC in Houston, Texas. Donald, thank you for holding. On line nine, you're on the Savage Nation 11 minutes after the hour. Dr. Savage? Dr. Savage? Yes, sir. What's on your mind? Thank you very much. And I just wanted to congratulate you on your book because you are a prophet. Maybe you don't have the revelation yet, but you started out with the title being God. And if you put God first, all things shall be added in you. And then you added faith. 
because God says without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then you rounded it out with God, faith, and what's the third thing? Reason. That's right. And what did God tell Abraham? Let's let's reason together. Even though your sins are as crimson and red, let's reason. And so God is in the business of reason, and you're tapped into that. So you are a prophet. Maybe you just don't have the revelation of it. Just keep up the good work. You know, I want to say this. You know, Don, Donald, we don't know each other. You're calling me from Houston, Texas. You're obviously a very spiritually, um, deeply spiritual man, very religious Christian, no doubt. You know, I don't know you. You don't know me. But you remind me of the man in that movie, Hacksaw Ridge. Did you ever see that movie? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You remind me of that kind of guy. And, you know, I would proudly be next to you anywhere in this world. And I know we're together just through the voice of the radio. But, Donald, thank you for those beautiful words. I'm sending you a copy of God, Faith, and Reason for you to enjoy and share with others. That's a beautiful call, i got to tell you. I watched that movie again on TV. I had to turn it off. That's a great movie. Clint Eastwood did it, right? Hacksaw Ridge. I mean, it's so graphic. The violence was so awful. The boys having their legs blown off. And, you know, the, the bayonets in the stomachs. I mean, how much can you, you sit and watch it? Uh, the vicarious thrill of what death and destruction and warfare. God bless the warriors. The ones who actually can stand up in a hail of bullets and come out of it with their brains intact without getting shot and still come back to life and not have lost their minds. God, we have to respect our warriors because without them, we wouldn't survive a day. I think about this every day. And so, you know, you watch that movie, and here was a guy, the movie was about a conscientious objector who was a Seventh-day Adventist who, when he went into boot camp, he said he will not carry a gun because he will not kill. Well, the other guys hazed him, beat him up, spit on him, cursed him, but he stuck it out. And when he went to battle, he became the bravest man in that group. He ran into a hail of bullets over and over and over again to rescue wounded American soldiers up on that horrible ridge somewhere, I think in Okinawa, and take them down by rope and save life after life after life. And for that, this, this man, this God-believing man, won the, the Congressional Medal of Honor. I mean, when you think about a man like that, and you think about how his faith carried him through the most horrible situation a person can be carried through. What can anyone listening to this show complain about? Anyone listening to this program anywhere in the United States of America is a king living in heaven compared to the way most of the world has lived and does live. Do you know that? And I think you should remember that. You should remember that as bad as you think your life is, you are still living better than most kings on earth ever lived. Do you know that? K-A-O-K -K in Louisiana, Paul, line five. Go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. How you doing? I just wanted, I, when I was listening to you, first time call, the first time. And basically, when you were talking about your book, if anybody's going to read it, I believe they will because I'm a Catholic. I do missionary work. And even though I'm set in my ways as far as Catholicism, I want to see and I want to read what other people think and what other people have to say. So I think they will read your book, and I do. I, I just wanted you to know that, that I was told once. When well, I was, that's what I'm saying. I don't know if very religious people we will. Um, we will. Will, read, will read the book. But it's odd that right now this book is number one amongst religious books, number one amongst Christian books, and I thought that was very intriguing that religious people are going to read God, Faith, and Reason. The question is, will the larger audience out there read such a book? And I don't know. That's up to God and up to... Uh, Something other than me, you know what I'm saying? And I thank you for calling from uh, Louisiana, K-A-O-K, -K, out there. I'm going to send you a copy of God, Faith, and Reason. It is now 16 minutes after the hour. That means the big hand is on the 16, and the little hand out here in San Francisco is on the 2. I'll be right back. All right, I want to switch to the Roy Moore uh, thing. My take is this. A man is innocent until proven guilty in this country. Right? Wrong. Under the new progressive communist socialist vermin, Everyone is guilty, even if they are innocent. And what stuns me the most is this rush to judgment simply on accusations. I cannot believe that people who pose as conservatives have joined the bandwagon and said, hang him, kill him, let him drop out, he's no good. Even the Bible itself talks about justice. Is this justice to say he did this without any trial? He's already killed? What kind of country are we living in? This is what went on 
in Stalinist Russia. This is what went on in Stalinist Russia. This is what went on in the French Revolution. And now we have the most malicious, vicious vermin in the form of lawyers who say that he did it without any trial, destroying a man in public and getting away with it because of their friends in the media. Here is Roy Moore himself in what he has to say in his own defense on the Savage Nation. Three days ago, the Washington Post published another attack on my character uh, reputation in Kim's death for the king. What is stop my political camp? Attacks I involved a minor child, completely unfalse and untrue, and for which they will be sued. All right, completely false and untrue. I don't know whether he dated minor children. I wasn't there. But today, one of the most disgusting lawyers on earth brings out a woman with the QVC earrings, the QVC necklace. They bought it on the air. There she was crying 40 years later. He did this. He did that. Well, if he did it, it was a crime then. And whether or not the statute of limitations wore off is irrelevant. But I don't know if he did it to you. Are you not seriously concerned that lives are being ruined because of vermin in the, in the legal and media professions who destroy lives without thought? Is this not reminiscent of what the vermin on the left did to the African-American jurist, Clarence Thomas? You don't remember what they did to him? Do you remember what they did to Clarence Thomas? Do you remember that on the verge of him being nominated, they smeared him? Is this not the same? I ask myself over and over again. And if it is the same, how could Donald Trump and so many Republicans stab Roy Moore in the back without a trial? And wouldn't that mean that they themselves are at risk next for such a smear? And shouldn't there be some constraints on these vicious, disgusting serpents with law degrees who take such pleasure in destroying people for monetary and political gain? Shouldn't a society that is supposedly just, with a justice system that is supposedly blind, not have a trial before destroying a man? I think so, which is why I wrote God, Faith, and Reason. Because tell me something. Do you actually believe we can live in a nation without reason and without faith and without God? I don't. Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth bribes and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Isaiah 1, 22 to 23. You know, I just flipped my own book open and fell upon that on page 125. I think it's very apt for what we are discussing right now that every man is innocent until proven guilty. Are you not seriously concerned that lives are being ruined by lawyers who themselves should be in prison? That anyone who brings such charges without any proof should be imprisoned for doing such a thing? That is called slander. That is called slander by any name. Oh, I hear people saying, oh, don't make such a big deal about Roy Moore. Just celebrate his downfall. Really? I should celebrate the downfall of a decent man? I don't know what he did 40 years ago. Do you? You have a co covenant with the devil or with God? Surely our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried, whereas we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Again from Isaiah. Isaiah was one of my favorite prophets. You may say, what do you mean by that? You're not a religious man. Well, what am I then? What kind of man am I? If, for if a man live many years, let him rejoice in them all. And remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. And, that cometh, and all that cometh is vanity. Do I actually believe there's an eternity of hell waiting for those of us who sin? I don't know if I believe that. Do I actually believe there's a heaven waiting for those of us who commit good acts on this earth? I hope so. But I don't know which place I'll be sent to. I have no idea. And so I wrote God, Faith, and Reason because I asked these questions as I wandered this earth. And I wrote a piece in this book called The Room with a View to Eternity. It's a fictional piece that you won't believe is in the same book in which I quote Ezekiel because it's fiction. And I end the book with the chapter, God is everywhere. I say God is not linear. God is infinite. 
Envision the Milky Way and all the stars in all the universes, all the pebbles, every grain of sand, all the crawling insects. God created all things big and small. How we approach the Creator defines us. Those who accept Jesus as the Son of God call themselves Christians. Those who bow to Allah are called Muslims. Jews worship the single entity they call God. What of Hind Hindus who worship not God but fantastic entities? And Buddhists who read their poetry of life and bow down to an idol? What do we say of the many who worship the Great Spirit? More tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow on the Savage Nation. Look, you got to expect something from me this week, and whether you appreciate it or not, or you're angry at me or not, I, I can't help it. I'm a man alone. I have absolutely no chance of being on television with this book. So you go in a bookstore in the next couple of weeks. You're going to shop for various people in your family. You're going to impulse buy. You know me. You're probably going to buy a copy or two of God, Faith, and Reason, as you normally do. I'm wondering when this book is in the front of those stores, Barnes & Noble, all those other great stores around the country, Books A Million, they all have them. Sam's Club, I believe. Costco's going to have them. Will the impulse buyer, when they see this man with the uh, salt and pepper beard, with the purple shirt, with the white stripes and the purple tie, with luminous eyes, uh, Vince Romini caught a piece of my soul with this picture, i got to tell you, it's, it's shocking what he caught in this picture. Will they buy the book just on a picture and the name, God, Faith, and Reason? I don't know. Will impulse buyers buy it? Look, one thing I want to tell you is this, and it's important for you to hear this. I am not a missionary. I am not a theologian. I am not a phony preacher trying to get you into my church. I'm not at all. All I can say is this, as I said many times on the show, We've gone from a time when St. Christopher medals were seen on cars in America to dream catchers in one generation. When I was a kid, it seemed as though every other car in New York City had a Catholic owner. They had little St. Christopher statues on a dashboard. Myself, I didn't have one, but I liked that there were people who believed in God. It gave me faith to look across at the other car and see there were faithful people. One day I wake up, it was post-Obama, and now there were dream catchers hanging off mirrors. In San Francisco, there are so many things hanging off mirrors. I don't know how people can see through their windshields. Mirrors, beads, voodoo things. There is voodoo paraphernalia hanging off automobile mirrors. And the country is melting down. It's total anarchy. As the third world invades us with their primitive magic, the country is melting down. You see, there's an hourglass. You turn an hourglass upside down and you watch the sand trickle through. Well, in my case, and I'm not trying to pull a tearjerker on you, there's more sand on the bottom than there is on the top. Now, there was a time when there was more sand on the top than on the bottom. And I thought I had unlimited time to do everything. I actually thought I was immortal. In many ways, when I was young, I thought I was that ancient Greek figure who could fly right near the sun and into the sun without getting burned. But let me tell you right now, nobody can. We, we can't. No one can. What I'm saying to you is this. My last book, Trump's War, was a bestseller. Number one, I'll repeat it over and over again. Number one, Trump's War. Number one, New York Times without any television appearances. You know why? Because of you. Just think of the power you have. Just think of the power you have. Fundamentally, you have all the power. You elected a president. Yes, I know he's being attacked. No matter what he does, he shook his hands. They attacked that. He smiled. They attacked that. Today is launch day for me. My book, God, Faith, and Reason, hits the bookstores tomorrow. And I want to talk about don't throw out the old for the new. Do you remember when you were in high school, you heard about the myth of Icarus? You know, the myth of Icarus, the old Greek myth in which Daedalus uh, was imprisoned in the, on the island of Crete. And so he made two pair of wings, gluing feathers to a wooden frame with wax. And he gave a pair of these made-up uh, wings to his son. And he warned his son not to fly too near to the sun. Because he said, son, if you get too near to the sun, that wax will melt and your wings will fall off. Well, 
as the younger prone to do, Icarus ignored his father's warning, and as he flew closer to the sun, soaring and soaring and soaring, the feathers came loose from his artificial wings, and Icarus plunged to his death into the sea. Why do I bring up this ancient Greek myth today on the Savage Nation? Well, yesterday I read a story in the New York Post about a famed daredevil, Valery Razov, who died crashing into a mountain in Nepal. He was a freefall jumper who wanted to complete the seven summits, jumping from the highest mountain on all seven continents. Razov flew too close to the sun. He rejected the wisdom that would have told him such feats while exciting are not very wise. This is the way in today's world. We are seeing a shift in the world where a new generation of people are rejecting the wisdom of the older generations. In the early days of civilization, taking the wisdom of the previous generation was tantamount to the survival of a race, of a people. There was no question you had to learn what had been learned if you're going to survive and move yourself, your tribe, your group up to the next level. It was life or death. Well, today's civilization has advanced so quickly that if a website doesn't load fast enough, this is cause for distress and anger. We've lost perspective because we've ignored the wisdom of the old. And that includes what we learn about God. Don't turn the dial because you're only two generations away from God-fearing family members. Maybe you can learn something by listening to your inner self. I touched upon this in God, Faith, and Reason in a chapter entitled Glimpses of Literature. On page 27, I talked about being a teenager and not knowing who I was. Well, I did all the typical things a young teenager would do. But I didn't stray too far from what Daedalus warned. I went back and looked at literature. That is, I wanted to learn from the wisdom that had come before me. I was an avid reader. That is one of the things that inspired this book. In a time where it seems everyone has rejected the old for the new, they refuse to look at the old wisdom despite seeing the new ways are tearing a nation and a people and a world apart. Sometimes the old wisdom is the only wisdom. Don't throw out the old for the new. Sometimes the old wisdom is the only wisdom. My book, God, Faith, and Reason, comes out tomorrow. It'll be in bookstores everywhere. And so I'm going to ask you, the deplorables, to do what you've done for me in the past. Maybe you could say you've done it for America in the past, because I haven't really changed my lifestyle. I really haven't changed my lifestyle. I ask people to know me. I live in the same little cottage, and I feed pigeons old bread every day. I have the same 13-year-old dog. I'm not doing badly. Don't get me wrong. But maybe you want to do something for someone in your family and buy them a copy of God, Faith, and Reason. Maybe you can help that empty soul realize that they're not alone in the world. Just a thought, huh? The point of the book in God, Faith, and Reason is there is no point to the book, God, Faith, and Reason. It is a man's search. It's an odyssey. I never saw God, nor do I pretend to have any special insights. What you will see in this book are snapshots of God, not a complete film. And I presented this book in an omnibus style, and it does not have to be read in precise sequential order. What you will see is one man's glimpses of God, images along the road of life. I do not represent myself as a theologian or a guru. There are no cheap thrills here for the spiritually bankrupt masses. It is my scrapbook of the highest power through dreams, memories, and stories, much like the ancient texts. Then the Lord caused to rain upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities, and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew up upon the ground, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19, 24 to 26, as quoted on page 97 of God, Faith, and Reason. You see, I salted, <laughs> I salted my text with Old Testament sayings set out in the text. For many people who have not looked at the Bible in their entire life, I want them to see the original language, the old wisdom. You say, well, what does that have to do with thing? I, I'm on Facebook. I own Google stock. I'm worth $12 billion. What the hell do you know? Jeremiah said, and I brought you into a land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. When you, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. What does that mean? I'll let you figure it out. I'm not God. I'm only a man. None of us last forever, as I said to you. And you have to struggle for what you want. 
And as you well know, I'm not a perfect man. I don't always practice what I preach. It doesn't make me a hypocrite. It makes me a man. For example, I occasionally eat high-fat cheese, even though I've written health books once a year. Twice a year, I'll eat a hot dog. Twice a year, I'll eat a steak. Hamburger with Teddy on Saturday. Took him to a restaurant, hamburger and fries. I've been gone all week, hadn't seen my dog. I took him out for a hamburger. I enjoyed myself. Even though I know it's poison for me, I ate it. We all do things we know aren't good for us, but we do them anyway. It's the same spiritually, right? Isn't it true? Well, turn to the ancients. I can't live for the next world. I don't even know if there is a next world. This is the only earth I know of, and this earth is the only heaven I know of. This is also the only hell I know of. But I figure that if this stuff has worked for others for thousands of years, there must be something to it. Are all those millions stupid? Are they all idiots, I ask on page four of God, Faith, and Reason? This book is more about questions than a quest, an odyssey rather than a prophecy. So I have a chapter on loss, for example. A lot of people I write are in pain right now. Everyone has lost something, either dear to them or that they believed in. People react differently to loss. For example, we see the madness of the progressives expressing their election loss with violence and hatred. Page 187. What is loss but losing that which you once possessed or thought you possessed? Consider what loss is. What has been the greatest loss in your life? How did you cope with it? Be it of a loved one, a business, your pride, your dignity, your job, your promotion, your health? It's an interesting question to me because loss is part of life. Everyone thinks they're only going to win. They think that every time they throw the dice, they're going to win. They're not. They're not going to win on every throw. And a parent who raises a child to think they're only going to win is doing that child a tremendous disservice. And Job spoke and said, let the day perish wherein I was born and the night wherein it was said a man child is brought forth. Let that day be darkness. It reminds me of the great poet A.E. Hausman, who wore black on his birthday, right until his old age. He cursed the day he was born because he was in pain from the day he was born. He suffered, but he didn't kill himself. He, he walked on that glass. He walked on that hot coal, but he did not kill himself and take the easy way out. He suffered through his whole life, as most people do. You're not alone if you're suffering. You know, maybe you watch the ads and you think everyone in the ad is real. They're not real. They're fake. They're as fake as the people in the news business. They're as fake as the pancake makeup. They're as fake as Joe Biden. They're as fake as Hillary Clinton. Everything is a fraud. So what is real? I'll let you figure it out. you got to understand something, and it's important for you to know this. When I was down and out, I had to go down to the core of my being and reach out to the man upstairs, to put it colloquially. But it didn't happen like a boom went off or lightning struck or Charlton Heston appeared in my living room with a ticket to eternity. He didn't give me a ticket to ride. I had to keep asking God for it, and it took me 25 years to climb out of that hole. Did you hear me? 25 years. 25 years of fighting. Not 25 days. Not two and a half days. 25 years I had to fight to get where I am. You see, God helps those who help themselves. He doesn't give you anything. By reaching out to God, maybe you can help yourselves. When Moses parted the Red Sea, the Jews entered the promised land. But guess what? They had to fight for it to gain the promised land. All God did was open it up for them. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. I'm a reclusive guy. Ask anyone who knows me. I rarely socialize. What I do is very selective. And mainly my dog, my family, and that's about it. I feed uh, old bread to the seagulls. I read a lot. I think a lot about uh, the eternal thing, you know, the eternal questions that man thinks about, which is what does it all mean? What are we doing here? Is there an afterlife? And I've been this way since I'm five years old. It's not like something new. I didn't suddenly slap a new suit on to match the book, God, Faith, and Reason. It's the way I've been since I've been a child. 
And when I wrote Trump's War, I did a deal with my publisher. And I said, I will write Trump's War in a crash schedule with you only if you agree to publish my God book. At the time, it had no title. And they said, okay, we'll do it. Well, here it is. Here it is. It's born. It'll be in the stores tomorrow. It's the end of a long road. Uh, and uh, it was supposed to be called God's War. Would you believe that? I originally was going to call this book God's War. And then a friend of mine, I'll tell you right now, straight up front, a friend of mine says to me, Michael, you just did a war book. You did Stop the Coming Civil War. You did Trump's War. You, you know, you're, you're typecasting yourself. He said, why don't you do what Clint Eastwood did? when he shifted from his Dirty Harry roles to the bridges of Madison County. So I came up with God, Faith, and Reason. And, you know, from the bottom of my soul, I must tell you something. I believe this book is going to be um, a groundbreaker for me, whether it sells a lot or a little. I don't know. That's up to you, not up to me. But it doesn't matter because the story will be there from the beginning to the end, from when I was a little boy chasing papers in the street because I thought it was a holy grail running down the street instead of old newspaper. I think I told you that story last week. In this book, um, God, Faith, and Reason, I have another story I want to read to you. It's one, two pages long that I think will tell you a little bit more about me and it'll lead you back to what I just said to you, which is that this book is going to change my life. I can't divulge what is coming because I truly don't know what is coming. Most men half my age have already given up on their life. They've already settled into the fact that they're not going to make anything of their life. They're going to live it through to the pension. They're going to work it out the best way they can. And they're going to do as, you know, as little as they can at their job, collect the check and go on with their life and, you know, pass on. I've never been that way. I'm still fighting. I'm still punching. I'm still trying to break through this kind of membrane. I don't even know why. If you forced me to say, why are you still fighting so hard when you have so much? Why are you still struggling? What are you trying to prove? I would say that I'm living for two lives. I told you that earlier. I said it before. I don't want to overplay it again. I'm living for me, and I'm living for my brother who never lived. So that's what I'm trying to say. So, well, I don't want to make the whole book and the whole show about my poor brother. He's dead and buried. He's been gone a long time. He's in a cold grave site on Long Island. He's been there since 1970. I'd rather leave that alone. It's too painful for me. I only mention that's part of the book. It's not the whole book. But i got to tell you something. It was the seminal formation of my life, living with that little boy. And uh, all I can say is, if he was alive today, he wouldn't have been thrown into uh, the Willowbrook Mental Hospital, State Hospital in, 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 in Staten Island, where he suffered like you could not believe. Imagine the worst mental hospital in the world where people beat each other up, where they defecate on themselves. If I ever told you the stories, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to walk after the show. I can't tell you what my mother lived through. And the point is, is I don't want to talk about it. We've come so far in the treatment of the mentally handicapped that we should thank ourselves that we're such a modern, great society.